It's good to see you guys back with us. How many of you guys believe that God is here today? Let's hear it. Listen, no matter what technology ever does, we know that God is still here. God is still in our midst. He's in our presence. And so I'm excited to hear from God today as we continue our series, Created for More. Now, before we jump in, just real quick, we're five weeks out from Easter. Five weeks out from Easter. Sorry, I'm out of breath. I have to run to the restroom again. <laughs> okay, let me catch my breath. Wow. <coughs> uh, also had to run and grab these cards backstage. Uh, but, but we're five weeks from Easter. And so uh, I, I just want to ask you to think about, pray about somebody that's in your life uh, that maybe is not connected to a church or maybe hasn't been to church in a while. Uh, man, we want, we want to invite them to church, especially on Sunday Easter Sunday, because that is the reason that we celebrate what God has done, right? I mean, without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we are nothing without that. So, so that's going to be a special Sunday, and we're going to have our normal after party with Easter egg hunts, food trucks, and all those things. Uh, but I've got 14 cards here, and I have more somewhere, but I could only find 14 last night in my drawer at home. And so I want to I invite you to snag these. I'm going to put these out in the lobby after we're done here. Uh, snag one of these, maybe two of these. If you got some people that you want to invite to church Easter Sunday, it's going to be a phenomenal Sunday. We're ready for it. We're praying for it. We believe God is going to move in great power. And so, uh, yeah, come and see me afterwards. Pastor Matthew already mentioned dinner with the pastors, but I want to encourage you to sign up today uh, so that we know how many how many spots to save. And, and listen, if you're new to the Living Stone, you may go, what does that mean? New means if you're new, all right? If you've been around for a while and you know who we are, you know who we're about, maybe this isn't for you. Uh, but if you want to learn more about who we are, hear our story, how God brought us to North Denver, where he's, where he's moving now and where we believe he's moving in the future, then this night is for you. So make sure you sign up today. Spots are limited. We're having the best Mexican food in town. I can't share all the details, but just know that that is something coming from a Texan. Uh, Mexican food here is hard to find. Good Mexican food. So, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> sorry. All right. So, <clears throat> I don't know if you've been paying attention over the past few weeks, but over the past few weeks, we've been talking about how God sees you and me. And I don't know if it, if it has landed with you, uh, we texted some of you last week and said, hey, what did you get out of today's service? And some of you said, I know how God sees me. God sees me as a masterpiece. God sees me as a saint. Turn to your neighbor, touch him real quick and say, hey, you are a masterpiece. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you are a saint. Now, those of you on the end, you can turn that way and it'll come around this way. All right. It's kind of like Pac-Man. Hey, but listen, you and I were created for more. You and I were created for relationship with God. And, and I don't know how that lands on you. I don't know that, how that hits you. But he sees such value in you. He calls you the salt of the earth. And I don't know how that hits you either. Maybe you're like, oh, well, why, thank you. I always knew I was salty. But listen, salt of the earth, the salt of the earth is valuable. In Jesus' days, that's how people paid for things was through salt. So salt was extremely valuable. In other words, that's how God sees you. You are so valuable to him. Just before church, I was out in the lobby and just talking with a, one of our students and She's going through a tough time at school, and, and I, got to, I got to remind her just for a brief moment that God sees her as a masterpiece, and I started welling up in tears because I just thought, man, if you knew how God sees you, if you just knew how he sees you, even in this moment, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you face, no matter what baggage you brought into this place, God loves you. He not only loves you, he calls you chosen. He chose you. The word saint means to be called out of this world. You've been called out of this world. He's chosen you for something greater. There's a kingdom that's coming. There's a kingdom that Jesus will be crowned king of kings and lord of lords in. And he's going to bring it to the earth. And you and I get to share in that someday. That's the inheritance that we have with Jesus. And I don't know how that hits you. 
But man, that fires me up. That makes me, that makes me think about, man, I can face anything today. I can face anything tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, because I know what awaits me. What awaits me? What awaits me and you? We're just getting a taste of it here. You are a child of God. You are a saint. You are a masterpiece. Last week we finished... Last week's sermon with that, that phrase, that, that word. But that's not the best translation for that word. You are a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he had planned in advance for you to do. We're not saved by works. We don't come into this relationship with God having to do good things. Remember, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. You and I were saved by God's grace. Grace is something we don't deserve, but we get to have a share in it. Nobody, not one person on this planet deserves to have a relationship with God, but he loves you and me so much that he was willing to lay down the life of his only son. So if it's Jesus, death on the cross, plus anything else, then it's kind of pointless for Jesus to die, if I'm honest. Jesus' death on the cross means everything to us. And what's more, his resurrection means everything for us. So, we wrapped up last week's sermon by saying that we are a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. We're created for more. That masterpiece, that word masterpiece is the the Greek word poema, which means poem. And I love that imagery because you have a story that's being written right now. God calls you a poem. Now, that's not very flattering to some of us, especially some of us men in the room. Oh, why, thank you, God. But the reality is, it's poetic when you think about it. That I was spiritually dead, and God wanted to bring me from spiritual death to spiritual life. And in so doing, he he gave his only son that, that his son would have to go from life to death in order to bring me from death to life. It's poetic. And I don't know how that hits you this morning either, but but God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He wants relationship with you. You're his poem. Your story is still being written. In fact, today's sermon message is this. I'm part of a greater story. I'm part of a greater story. You are part of a greater story. Since the beginning of time, God has positioned and put in motion a plan that affects everything. We as followers of Jesus are invited into a relationship with him so that we can engage with him in building up his church and bringing redemption to the entire world. That is a privilege. When you think about what God sees in you, when you think about what he's asking us to do in joining him, In joining him, wherever he's working, wherever he's moving, that means we get to have a hand in it. Now, some of you, when I ask you to take some of these home, you're like, I I could never invite anybody to church, or I could never share my faith with anybody. But it's not that difficult, if I'm honest with you. Talking about what God is doing in your life is really easy. And maybe you're not seeing the things that God is doing in your life. But God is constantly working in our lives, if we're looking And so when you take something like this and you invite someone to church, maybe you're thinking, well, I don't want to enforce my beliefs on anybody. Listen, you're not. You're not. You're inviting them to be a part of what God is doing here at the Livingstone Church. God will have his way. He will draw men to himself, women to himself. The pressure's off of us. We just share what God is doing in our lives. Hey, you should come to church with us. We've got a great pastor. We've got a great kids ministry. They have great worship. They have great, it's a great, it feels like family. A few weeks ago, well, a few months ago, uh, before we, before we have services, we meet out in the lobby and we, we talk about, uh, you know, ways to hype up our, our volunteers and to really focus in on what maybe God is speaking to us this morning and 
And so uh, oftentimes we'll go around the room and we'll, or around the circle there, and we'll highlight someone. We'll, we'll honor somebody. We did that this morning. Uh, right now, up in the kids' ministry, uh, Arlene, Arlene Masterson is serving. We honored her this morning. She is a constant servant, a servant-hearted woman that gives without any kind of thought of receiving. And, uh, and, and so I, I thought about this earlier today, too. We used to ask, what do you love about the Livingstone Church? In that huddle time, we ask people, what do you love about this church? And we always hear the same things, that this is a family. This is a group of people that cares for me. This is a group of people that, that genuinely loves me, that serves me. And I can't be more proud to be the pastor of a church like this. Because God is already working behind the scenes. My first point this morning, my first point is your story matters. Your story, all of it matters. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it matters. Your story matters. And maybe you walked in here this morning not feeling like a masterpiece, not feeling like a saint, not feeling like God loves you. i got to be honest with you. I feel that way too. But your story matters. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul writes this entire letter to a group of people, maybe about the size of this church, maybe a little smaller actually. And these groups of people have one thing in common. They have Jesus in common. They are a family together, both Jews, mainly Gentiles, meaning if you're a Gentile, that's everyone else that's not a Jew. And so the God of the Jews, the the God of the Hebrews, we just sang that song, right? The last song of the the worship set, uh, God of Jacob, God of Moses, God of Mary. That is a, a Hebrew God, but God has invited us to be a part of his family. In fact, scripture tells us that we've been grafted into his family tree. That's a tremendous honor. And so Paul, Paul who writes this, he was a Jewish man. Let's read this. I I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Listen listen to this. In in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Let's stop right there. He drops this race, right? This Gentile. I, Paul. A prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. That sounds accusatory, doesn't it? Well, that's how we read it in our Western translation. But, but that wasn't accusatory. What Paul's saying is, look, I'm in prison right now in Rome. I am in Rome right now in prison writing this letter to you. Paul is a prisoner because of his faith in Jesus. If you were to go back to Acts chapter 20 through 22, you would read the story about what Paul is in prison for right here, right here. And here's why Paul says, I am in prison right now for you, you Gentiles. Back in uh, the days before Paul was a believer, before he was a follower of Jesus, Paul had, uh, had become very zealous in his religion. His religion was Judaism. He had heard word of this new movement of Jesus' followers that was birthed at Pentecost 50 days after Passover, roughly 50 days after Jesus was raised, or not not raised, put to death on the cross. Jesus had told his followers to stay in Jerusalem because he was going, going to send the Comforter. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, right then, Right there at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls down from heaven like a loud rushing wind. And that wind fills the entire house. And the people come outside and start speaking in other languages. If you look at Acts chapter 2, Peter goes outside the house. And Peter is speaking to people who have come from all quarters of the world to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast of Pentecost. And while they're there, all these people, they don't speak the same language. And so Peter goes outside the house filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, this is the same guy just a few weeks before that was hiding, that was denying Jesus. And now he's filled with this powerful presence of God. 
And he's speaking with such boldness and conviction. And as he goes outside the house, he starts speaking about this Jesus of Nazareth that they have killed, that the Jewish people have killed. And those that are standing by say, hey, aren't all these men fishermen? Or aren't, aren't these men, are not all these men from Galilee? Then how is it that we hear what they're saying in our own native tongue? God does a miracle right then and there because they were engaging the power of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lived in them. That had never happened before. And here's what's beautiful about that. We take that for granted sometimes in the church. I have this powerful presence of God inside me, and sometimes I don't tap into it. Sometimes I don't lean in to that power. But I want to experience God in a fresh way, especially with the world that we're facing, especially with what we're facing, what our kids are facing. If we don't tap into that, if we don't lean into his presence, I get terrified thinking about what might happen. Not, not, not to our faith necessarily. Once we are in relationship with God, he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. But Paul, Paul knew this. Paul knew this when he writes this. He says, I'm in prison. I'm a prisoner for you, you Gentiles. Paul had, uh, had become this zealous follower of Judaism. He was charged with this mindset to snuff out this movement of Jesus' followers that had begun in Jerusalem, that had begun on Passover. It was up to him. It was his job. It was his duty to go to those who were followers of Jesus and separate them, throw them in jail, separate families to persecute them, to have them whipped, to have them beat, to have them flogged so that they would denounce Jesus. In fact, there are times that he actually did that. There were people that denounced their Christianity if that were even possible. And so Paul probably has this weight of guilt on him when he writes this letter. But Paul's story matters. Your story matters. What happened later? After he had killed Stephen, he had killed the first Christian, the first Christian martyr. Paul was responsible for his death. Paul was on the road to Damascus sometime later, and Jesus appears to him with such a bright flash of light. There were two men traveling with him. They saw the light. They did not hear the voice that spoke to them. But Jesus said, Paul, Paul, why are you... Actually, it was Saul. He said, Saul, Saul. Before his name was Paul, it was Saul because he was not a follower of Jesus yet. But he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. In that moment, Paul is completely blinded. Scales form on his eyes. He's told by Jesus to go to this man's house to to have them removed, and Ananias would pray over him, and the scales would fall off, and that's what happened. From that moment on, Paul, who was at the time named Saul, had a, had a moment of crisis, an identity crisis. Everything he knew about God was shifting in his mind. Everything that he thought was true was shifting. In fact, in that moment, he truly became a follower of Jesus. Your story matters. Fast forward just a few years later, Paul, his name is now Paul. He's planted many churches in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, even in Rome. He's helped launch several churches, including Ephesus. He's towards the end of his earthly life. He stops by Ephesus on the way back to Jerusalem. And there he, he spends time with the elders and they, they probably ris, remin, they're probably reminiscing about the old days when they used to have to set up and tear down church. Just kidding, they didn't have to do that. But they're probably reminiscing about how God had worked so powerfully. And Paul says, I will never come back this way again. This will be the last time you see me on this side of eternity. And there's, a, there's probably this beautiful moment of emotion there that's shared between them and the elders. And Paul sets off for Jerusalem. He lands at Caesarea. It's on the coast of the Mediterranean. He lands there. A man who's a follower of Jesus takes Paul's belt and he wraps it around his hands and he says, please don't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. The owner of this belt will be tied up like this and will be flogged and beaten. 
Paul said, I got to go. I got to go. Because Jesus has appointed me, the apostle, to spend time advancing his kingdom, expanding the movement of Jesus' followers. But not just anybody. To the Gentiles. That's you and me. Without Paul's ministry, we wouldn't have church here today, guaranteed. Paul goes to Jerusalem. There's a riot that breaks out because someone sees him and they say, there's the man that brought a, a Gentile who is unclean into this clean outer court and, and this, this, this riot erupts around the temple and, and they take Paul and they're going to throw him in jail. They're going to they're going to flog him. They're going to beat him. Probably put him to death. He's arrested, and Paul asks the the Roman soldiers, "Hey, can I speak to the crowd real quick?" And he says, "Listen, I was I was a man just like you. I was zealous for the cause of Judaism. I had a misunderstanding of who God really is." And he tells them his story. And his story to Damascus when he was blinded by the light. And he shares with them what Jesus had told them. And they were stunned. A silence fell over the crowd. And they were almost leaning in until he said this one phrase that Jesus said. He said, I'm calling you, Paul, to be a minister to the Gentiles. And they just lose it. A riot erupts. They arrest him. They're about to flog him. He pulls out his Roman citizen card and says, sorry, you can't flog me. I was born here. You can't flog me. I'm a Roman citizen. So they ship him off to Rome. And this is where he writes this letter. For the sake of those who don't even know God. For the sake of you Gentiles. You see, when God works, there are no boring stories. Maybe your life is, is reminiscent of mine. I grew up in church. I became a believer at the age of probably seven, eight. Got baptized at nine. There's nothing really that cool about my story, if I'm honest with you. And maybe you share that sentiment. I, I didn't have this, this past history of like living in sin and you know living in all this worldly stuff like a, like a pagan. And I finally recognized my sinful ways and I gave my life to Jesus. And it was... It was crazy. I left all that life. Now, I don't have a story like that. I have a story that's pretty simple. My dad became a believer at the age of 30. He started taking us to church. I heard the gospel. I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. Even as a nine-year-old, eight, nine-year-old, it made sense to me. When God works, there are no boring stories. I knew that God had changed my life. I knew that he had given me a purpose. I knew that he put his Holy Spirit in me. And the reason that he puts his Holy Spirit in me is to draw me out of the pit that I was in, the pit of sin, and to bring me to true freedom. Remember, we've left that pit behind. We said that a few weeks ago. Remember that? Let's make sure you're still awake. Turn to your neighbor and say, we've left that pit behind. (laughs) It's not very energetic, is it? Man, if you left the pit behind, you'd be like, man, I've left the pit behind. I'm no longer going back to that pit. When God works, there's always change. When God works, there is always change. Here's what I mean by that. If the Bible says that you came from spiritual death to spiritual life, there ought to be a change, right? My dad, when he was uh, a few years ago, I asked him about his salvation experience, and and I said, tell me, because you were were 30 years old when you accepted Christ, and and he said, yeah. And he, he, said, he said, something clicked in my mind that hadn't clicked before. He'd been to church, but it never really clicked in his mind until this one Sunday. It made sense to him. And he was so convicted. That it's like the Spirit was just telling him and drawing him closer to God. And he said, you know, I've prayed the prayer in church, but, but something changed that Sunday. Something changed in my heart. Something changed in my life. When God works, there's change. And remember, we said last week, we've left that tomb behind. Your story matters. The story of you coming from spiritual death to spiritual life matters. That is a powerful story. Something has changed in you. When anyone ever 
trusts in Jesus, whether through a prayer or a verbal prayer or a prayer in their heart, confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart. That's what the Bible says. If we want to have relationship with him, we have to believe in our hearts, confess with our mouths that Jesus is who he says he is. He's the son of God who died on the cross that took my sin. And that's it. It's a free gift. We believe that he was buried and on the third day he was raised back to life. We've left that tomb behind. And we celebrate that through baptism. In fact, next week you're going to see this. Uh, This is why we put this on our shirts. Raised to life. Raised to something good. Raised never to go back into the tomb. Some of us still may have some grave clothes on, but man, this is what church is about. You got to take those grave clothes off because he set you free from the tomb. We just sang about it this morning. You're, You're free. You're no longer bound by the tomb. You're no longer bound by death. You're no longer bound by sin. We've left that tomb behind. Did you realize you're our church's greatest resource? Did you realize that? I mentioned it earlier. What people say when we gather around the huddle. But you, you may not feel like much, but you are our greatest resource. You are. If I left tomorrow, this church would continue. If I passed away in a year, this church would continue. If we couldn't meet in a place like this, this church would continue. You know why? Because we are the church. We, the body of believers, those who are called out of this world. The Bible says that we are the called out ones. That's what church means. It's the Greek word ekklesia. It means we are the called out body of Christ. We would find ways to meet if we couldn't meet in a public setting like this. We might have to take this church underground someday. And I I, I almost long for those days because that's when God's spirit moves in great power. You know, when communism came to Russia, all communism had to do was take away the buildings and the priests. And Christianity virtually died. When communism came to China, they realized that The the Chinese church, they realized that people were their greatest resource. And so they empowered people to do the work of the ministry, just like Jesus says in his word. They empowered their greatest resource, which was people, to find their giftings, to find what only you can do in his church. And don't you love that about God, that he created you for a specific purpose? He's gifted you with gifts that nobody else has in this church. There are things that only you can do here in this church. No one else. Just you. You are our greatest resource. Paul says this in verse 2. He says, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I have already briefly written. Listen, when he says this, when he writes this to this church, he says, you are our greatest resource. In fact, in verse 2, the very first, very first sentence, he says, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That word administration is the Greek word. It's the Greek word oikon. Hold on. I don't want to hurt myself. Oikon. <laughs> I'm going to hurt myself. Oikonomia. Oikonomia. That means it's, it's where we get our word economy from. So this is not saying, you know, things cost more, cost of living has gone up, eggs cost $6 a dozen now. This is not what Paul is talking about. He's not talking about economy as we think of it. He's talking about the stewardship that God has entrusted to Paul. In other words, here's God saying, Paul, I trust you with this message of grace, that you will be a faithful steward of what I'm entrusting to you. He says, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace, what he's entrusted to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into every ministry of Christ, a mystery of Christ. Mystery is a sacred secret. It's a sacred secret. Here's, here's, the, here's the kicker. Only the church is in on this sacred secret. Only the church understands God's grace. 
Only those of us that are called out understand what God wants from us. He wants full surrender to Him. Not just praying the prayer and believing in our hearts and confessing with our mouths. That is how we enter into relationship with Him, but we can't stop there. He's created you for more. He's created you for more. Your story matters. He says, in reading this, you'll be able to understand the revelation that was given to me, which was not made known to the people in other generations as it was, has been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. Listen to this. This mystery, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, it's easy to read over that and miss what Paul's saying. But what really Paul's saying is, hey, we have a great inheritance in the kingdom of heaven just for us. We've been called out of this world. We've been given salvation. We have a relationship with God. He's given us a new life with new purpose. To take the secret, the mystery that has been hidden for generations past. He is now entrusted to you and to me. Man, what an amazing thing that he's entrusted to us. I don't know if that hits you well, but, or, or even how that hits you. But, but he's entrusted the special message of the gospel. That Jesus loves you. That Jesus died on the cross for you. And when we engage God in that, when we trust him, when we surrender our lives to him. We're saying, God, take my life. Take my story. Even if it's boring to me, it's not boring to you, God. You take it. You use it. I'm a masterpiece. I'm a called out saint. I am a child of God, and I'm part of God's holy family. We're members of one body. Shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful statement. You know, it matters when you're here. It matters when you're here at church. If you're our church's greatest resource, then it honestly matters when you're here. We, we feel it when, you don't, when you're not here. We truly do feel it. Like worship just, just it's good, but, but if you're not here, it, it, we're just missing part of our family. Years ago, my wife and I, we, we walked through a, a very difficult time having a miscarriage. It was right before Avery was born. Avery's the, the girl that was playing the guitar right here. She's my oldest daughter. Right before we got pregnant with Avery, we had a miscarriage, and it was one of the most difficult seasons of our lives. Uh, it was hard to mourn in a season while I was still doing college ministry and trying to be on for people, if that makes sense, trying to be, you know, normal, as normal as I can be. And it was a season where God was truly, truly testing us. God spoke to us and, and through Avery has actually healed our hearts. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't mean that we still don't miss our loved ones, right? And we never knew this baby. But we know that that baby is in heaven right now. We know that that baby is somewhere with God. And, and someday we'll go to him. Just like King David said about his son that passed away. Every Christmas that comes and goes, because that's about the time that this happened, my mind and my heart sometimes go back to that moment, and it just feels like someone's missing, if that makes any kind of sense. And, and truly, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be dramatic here, pulling your heartstrings, but, but when you're not here, and we feel some of that same distance, we feel some of that same loss. It's so different when you're here. This is family, and this is God's family, and God's got a word for us, and what an honor it is that we gather together to worship. People, people matter to God, so people, what we say here at the Living Stone, people are the mission. People are the mission. What do we mean by that? Well, we started this church not to steal other believers from other churches. There's plenty of other churches that are great. There's plenty of other churches that are 
you know, blown it out of the water on everything, on every level. But we started this church for people who are far from God so that they can hear the good news of what God has done for them. People are our mission. And you are our greatest resource in that mission. Listen to what Paul says in verse 7. He says, I became a servant by the gospel, this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden, for, hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of, his, of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in him, through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for which you for, for which are your glory. Listen, Paul, when he writes to, to this church in Ephesians, in, in Ephesus, this church that's in Ephesus, he's really putting it out there for them and inviting them to join where God's already moving. He says, the, the mystery that's been entrusted to us, the mystery that's been entrusted to you and me, has been hidden for ages and generations. It's almost like the prophets were able to look across the mountain peaks of, of, of what God was sharing with them. You know, when we look out to the west, we see the mountains, we see ridges, we see taller mountains and taller mountains and taller mountains. We don't see the valleys. We don't see what's in the valleys. We don't see some of the things that are going on in the valleys, but we can see the high points. For generations past, only the prophets were able to see the high points of what God's story was all about. You and I are in this season where we're, we're seeing, we're looking back. We see all the valleys. We're heading towards the top. You know, the only difference between every other religion and Christianity is that while we're walking this trail to the top of the mountain, our God meets us at the trailhead. He meets us and he walks with us in this journey. He's still writing your poetic story. Your story matters. You are our greatest resource. God wants to use your life in the life of people here. What an honor that is that our God would start at the trailhead and walk up this mountain with us. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior. Maybe you've been to church. Maybe you've never truly understood that Jesus' death on the cross was just for you. That he died just for you. He, he had you on his mind when he was giving up his life. The Bible says that everybody has sinned. Nobody's perfect. All of us have fallen short of God's standard of perfection. But God loved you. And he gave his only son for you. And here's the, here's the good thing. Here's the good news. If you believe in him, you put your faith in him, you put your trust in him this morning, you can have relationship with him. I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me with every head bowed, every eye closed in the room. This is just you and God. Prayer is just talking to God. So just tell him. Say, God, I know there are things in my life that have offended you. I know there are things that I've done that are sinful against you. Did you realize that the Bible says without covering that sin, you cannot have relationship with God. God wants to cover that, delete it, erase it once for all. So tell him this. Say, God, I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe that he was put in the ground and on the third day he was raised back to life. Tell him that. Now tell him thank you. Say, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer this morning, would you be so bold as to raise your hand where I can see it? Raise it high. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else pray that prayer for the first time? 
Raise it where I can see it. Thank you. Can we just give it up for those that prayed that prayer today? Such a great thing what God is doing here. It's an honor to do what we get to do. It really is. Father, we're so grateful for who you are. We love you. In these next few moments as we sing, God, would you be honored in this place and in our lives? Thanks for joining us today. Just wanted to invite you. Don't stop there. Subscribe to this channel for future messages. Connect with us on social media or if you're ever in the area physically, come join us for a live service. We'd love to have you celebrate you. We believe that the best is yet to come. And in 2023, God's going to do something incredible for you. I would say that giving changed my world because it's just given me a perspective um, that things are temporary. Um, I think I've gotten used to viewing money or objects as temporary. I think it's just allowed me to live more open-handed with everything I have. <laughs> it, I get less frustrated at children when they destroy things that we have. Um, than I probably would if I was putting any kind of hope into those items. I think that giving and, and generosity has impacted me uh, at the heart. Um, that, that giving of our time or our talents or our treasures, it may not seem like what I have to give is very, very much, but but when I give it, I don't always get to see what it changes, but I know that it changes me. When I, yeah, live open-handedly and, and everything I have is ultimately God's. So really, I'm just giving it back to Him.